Welcome back to the GO training. This is module 5.1, General Introduction to the World Health Organization. This module will be useful to anyone who's new to WHO, but equally informative, I hope, for WHO staff who are being deployed to refresh what we know about the organization and our role in the Ebola response. So by the end of this session, you should be able to describe WHO's core mandate and functions, describe how WHO is working in countries, and also explain how WHO works in a health emergency, such as the Ebola virus disease outbreak. All right, here we go. So let's go back to 1948, when WHO's constitution was crafted, the mission of WHO is the attainment by all peoples of the highest possible levels of health. This is a very, very important visionary statement that still guides our work in 2015. The Constitution goes on to say that health is a state of complete physical, mental and social well-being and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. This actually tells us that more than six decades ago, the founding fathers and mothers of WHO understood that health required a social, mental model and not just a medical model. Right at the beginning of WHO, six core functions were identified. Um, and these continue to be relevant to the work of the organization. From time to time, as health priorities change, our priorities have been reshaped, but the core functions of WHO have remained unchanged since its founding. What are these six? Please, please take time to read this graphic uh, after this module so that you understand the entirety of the functions that WHO has in the world. The first one is about providing leadership for international health and global public health. The second is about shaping the research agenda. So research that's undertaken not only provides evidence uh, for what we do, but actually benefits everybody in the world. The third is a very, very unique function that WHO has, and that is setting norms and standards. So we take evidence and WHO shapes them into guidelines, norms and standards. Everything from the quality of uh, what is clean air, what is uh, clean water, to how should particular diseases be treated uh, universally, but also in certain parts of the world. So this norm and standard setting is a very, very special function of WHO. The fourth function is really to look at policy options and to help governments, uh, give governments policy options that are not only based on evidence, but are ethical. The fifth function is direct technical support, sending experts, expert knowledge and other resources to countries to improve and strengthen public health systems. The last one is monitoring global trends. So with many decades of work on tuberculosis, for example, are the trends going up or coming down? And based on these trends, where should governments and the international community invest their efforts? The same, because we are looking at the global trends, burden of disease, what diseases are where, what diseases are making people sick, what diseases are killing people, we were able to identify that non-communicable diseases are now on the rise. So these six functions make up WHO's core role and functions, regardless of where we work, regardless of the priority areas of public health we work in. Now for the current period, WHO has six leadership priorities in which these six core functions are played out. The first leadership priority is universal health coverage. And universal health coverage goes all the way back to the founding of WHO. This is in fact why WHO was established, so that everybody, every man, every woman, every child on this planet could have access to the best possible health care to protect themselves and their families. And so universal health coverage is a value, it's a leadership priority, and it is a program. And we do this through equitable access uh, to health systems, health services in all countries. The second current leadership priority is about the international health regulations and the international corporations that all countries have agreed to to protect all our peoples. What does this mean? It means that a threat in one country 
can be a threat to all of the population of this planet. So in 2005, building on many, many years, actually over 100 years of international agreements, uh, international sanitary agreements and so on, all member states, all governments came together and revised the international health regulations. This was just after the world was reeling from the SARS outbreak of 2003. And the international health regulations were revised so that several things were required from member states, from governments. Governments were supposed to put in systems in place and build up their own abilities and capacities to identify, to, to detect, to report and to respond to any public health emergency that could pose of international concern. And the international community had obligations to itself, to each other, and WHO Secretariat has specific uh, responsibilities in this. So the international health regulations to respond to public health emergencies is the second leadership priority of the current era. The third leadership priority is about making sure that people have access to medical products um, and diagnostics. This is very, very important. As we have success in many communicable diseases, we are now starting to battle widespread non-communicable diseases, which requires uh, diagnostics and treatment for the rest of people's lives, so lifelong treatment. And it's really WHO's role to really make sure that all governments, all people have access to these uh, very, very life-saving and life-enhancing products. The fourth priority is really about social, economic and environmental uh, determinants of health. So we fulfill our functions in following these trends, setting norms and guidance, giving technical support to governments to protect people from social, economic and environmental risks to health. The fifth leadership priority is really a new priority for global health and it's been increasing in importance over the last few decades and that is the priority related to non-communicable diseases. Uh, non-communicable diseases, what are they? Heart disease, cerebrovascular disease, high blood pressure, um, diabetes and the many cancers that are now common in society. So these diseases are linked to four common risk factors. To uh, not enough physical exercise, poor, unsuitable diet with too much sugar, too much fat, too much salt, to smoking, and uh, to other risk factors. So these risk factors result in all of these non-communicable disease that have not only medical impacts but have socio-economic impacts for individuals, for families, for communities and whole nations. So WHO is really leading the work on this. Last but not least, there were many priorities defined by world leaders lead in 2000, and these were called the Millennium Development Goals. Several of the Millennium Development Goals are directly related to health, and WHO has named this as its sixth priority for the current period. So Millennium Development Goals on reducing maternal and child deaths, increasing the number of people who have access to HIV, TB, TB AIDS and malaria medication, uh, water and improve access to water and sanitation. So all of these are existing priorities of the global community that WHO continues to prioritize in the current period. So it's very important to understand that we have six functions and in the current period we have six leadership priorities. One of them is related to public health emergencies under the international health regulations and that's where the Ebola response comes in. So I wanted to really situate the Ebola response in WHO's mission and vision, our constitution, our role and function and now our current set of six leadership priorities. Please look at this graph again as well so you situate what we are doing very clearly in the overarching work of the organization. So what is it that WHO actually does? So there is the global health agenda and WHO's comparative advantage. We lay these over one another. We look at the core functions. We look at addressing the main challenges in the world. And we look at priorities going forward into the future. And we actually craft this, massage this into a general program of work, which we call a GPW. This is one of the acronyms you'll hear in WHO. These feed into other 
uh, international agreements and commitments like the UN Millennium Development Goals. And within the organization, you will see in the flow diagram, it goes to a medium term strategic plan, which has strategic objectives and it is really a results oriented plan. And these are then further worked into work plans for the whole organization with the different uh, parts of the organization, country offices, regional offices, and the headquarters and the global work uh, feeding into, into these strategic objectives. So within WHO, this is how we take global priorities, overlay them with our roles and functions, and work it right into workable everyday work plans that colleagues like me, and maybe you, have to fulfill. So um, there's been a lot of debate over the years about the added value of WHO. And if you were to ask me, and I've worked for WHO for 14 years, I would say the following comparative advantages are very much relevant today. Some of them are very challenging, but they remain relevant. The first one is WHO as a neutral broker. Uh, because we are a secretariat and, a, if you like, an aggregate of 194 member states, the secretariat has to maintain its neutrality to uh, look at the needs and the demands of all countries. Also, within countries, we have a role working with governments, NGOs, uh, non-state actors, civil society, so on. So our role as neutral broker is increasingly challenging, but this is a very, very relevant role that we have. We have nearly universal membership. 194 governments have come together and they collectively make decisions on global public health, on what are global priorities and the working of the WHO Secretariat. We have to have impartiality. By having so many voices inside, we have to have mechanisms for impartiality. We have strong convening power. There are many, many difficult public health roles where WHO is invited to convene everybody, sometimes with conflicting views and concerns, to come together to look at joint ways ahead. And as I said before, the normative and technical roles. As the UN Specialized Agency for Health, we're one of the very few UN bodies that is allowed to create uh, guidance that can influence policy in countries and that have wide-ranging impacts. We can also form uh, international law. So the International Health Regulations is an example of international law crafted by WHO. The Framework Convention on Tobacco Control is another example of us fulfilling this function. So these are six comparative advantages of WHO that are present in, in all our work, but also in the Ebola response. We work, uh, we have presence in um, more than 150 countries around the world with many more sub-offices, six regional offices, and of course our headquarters uh, doing global work in Geneva, Switzerland. There's a lot of information on what we do in countries if you go to our website. And on this particular link uh, at www.who.int slash country dash corporation, you will be able to find for every country where we have uh, a presence we have a country cooperation strategy. You'll be able to find an interactive map, searchable functions, and really information on implementing WHO's reform at country level. So please visit the website, particularly for the countries that you are being deployed in, and find out what work WHO was doing in countries already. And this is a big advantage of WHO because we have already been in these countries, including Guinea, Liberia, and Sierra Leone, where we are now responding to uh, Ebola outbreak. We have networks, we have existing programs, we have existing partnerships, we have unique knowledge and relationships about the country. So please find out more about this and also find out what is happening on those areas as well. The people who are working on other programs will be a resource for you when you're deployed to country. So it's very important that you know this. Before we finish this module, I wanted to focus a little bit more on WHO's work in public health emergency. Remember, in the current leadership priorities, international health regulations is priority two. It's very, very important. And what we've done is the international health regulations apply to member states and to WHO secretariat. We've taken WHO's, uh, WHO secretariat's responsibilities 
and for public health emergency and we have developed something called the WHO Emergency Response Framework or the ERF and this determines how the organization responds to emergencies under the overall umbrella of the International Health Regulations of 2005. And this ERF, the Emergency Response Framework, is obviously work in progress and we're, as a result of Ebola we are most likely going to uh, try and improve that even more. But these two documents, one, an international legislation, international health regulations, and the other, WHO's emergency response framework, internally operationalizing our obligations, really define and, and shape the way the organization responds. Now, for many years, WHO has been part of a very, very important uh, network called the Global Outbreak Alert and Response Network, or GON. And when you're deployed, you may see many GON members being deployed with you, or you may be a GON member following this training. So the Global Outbreak Alert and Response Network is a network of institutions, not people, institutions worldwide, with many, many specialities, so epidemiologists, logisticians, technical experts, communication communications experts, all sorts of experts who are required to effectively respond as teams in outbreaks. So uh, this is a very important resource and again you will meet GON teams in the field. So these three entities, one an international piece of law, the second an internal WHO operational framework and third a very very important uh, network for outbreak response are three important aspects I really want you to know about. The international health regulations very, very important. This is one of only two internationally legally binding public health instruments agreed by member states. This one has been ratified by 194 countries or state parties, including all WHO member states. It significantly contributes to global public health security by providing a new framework for the coordination of the management of events that may constitute a public health emergency of international concern. It supports improvement in the capacity that all countries have to detect, assess, report or notify and respond to public health threats. Yeah, the revised version has been implemented since 15 June 2007 and in fact a very important deadline is coming up in June 2016 where member states should have achieved minimum levels of capacities to do this to detect, assess, notify and respond to public health threats. The Ebola outbreak in West Africa was declared a public health emergency of international concern in August 2014 under the international health regulations and this has triggered a chain of events within countries by the entire international community and by the World Health Organization to step up and scale up the response. Uh, the emergency response framework, as I said, is WHO's internal framework for responding. And um, I, I will leave this slide with you to understand how we are doing this. Uh, again, as I said, this is under review and, and we believe that as time goes on over the next few months, we are going to tweak this a little bit more to further improve uh, and strengthen the way we respond. Gone, um, I talked to you about a technical collaboration of institutions and networks. They pool human and technical resources for rapid identification, confirmation and respond to outbreaks of international importance. So thousands of experts have been deployed through GON since the Ebola outbreak in West Africa was first confirmed in March 2014. So this is an extremely, extremely useful uh, network that we are very, very proud to be part of. So here we are. A quick refresher for WHO staff as to what we do, not just in emergencies, but WHO's mandate, role and functions. And for those of you who may be less familiar with WHO, I hope this is an introduction. Please go and follow the uh, web links that we've put up here. I'd like you, before you conclude this session, to uh, just reflect, write down on a piece of paper, three things that you remember from this session. So write down three things, they could be facts, they could be thoughts that you've had. They could even be questions that you're asking because of this session. So what do you remember from this session? I will see you in the next session. Mm -hmm.